Yeah, so no, Kirk said my organizational skills, but it's not really mine. Andy and his crew did most of the work. I just answered the phone from time to time. And if I knew there was a problem, I let it go to voicemail first in the hope that they'd figure the problem out themselves so that when I phone them, it's all good. <laughs> just uh, before I get going, I just wanted to, uh, if you haven't heard, let you all know, next year we are going to have a North American equip, including the U.S. and Mexico. Because we haven't, we've been trying to do the world equip for a couple of years and haven't been able to get it right. So we thought, what's the next best thing we can do? North American equip. So yeah, we're going to do that next year, 21 to 23 June. And it's going to be in Chicago. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. I mean, this is great. This is just the West Coast. Add another two nations and the East Coast in. It's going to be even better. So this year, the Lord's been speaking to me a lot out of uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer. I know when we look at Jonathan and his armor bearer, we often think of, yeah, the support, the good teamwork. Let me say there's a lot more to Jonathan and the armor bearer than just the good teamwork. There's a lot more to it than being a good, strong supporter. In fact, there's many points that we can pick up from the account. Well, let's look at a couple of them today. We won't do all of them, just a few of them. But before we get into it, I'd like us to remember the setting that this takes place in. So we normally start at the beginning of chapter 1 Samuel chapter 14, and we find them all sitting there. But if we dial it back a little bit into 1 Samuel 13... We see that Israel actually finds itself in a very sorry state. It says they, they, they don't even have any weapons. They've got an army together. The army had come now getting ready for battle, but they've got no weapons. They weren't even allowed to sharpen their own farming implements. If they wanted to do that, they had to go to the Philistines and pay them to sharpen it for them. The only person or people who had any weapons were Jonathan and his father Saul. 1 Samuel 13, 22 says, So on the day of battle, not a soldier was Saul, and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. Imagine turning up for battle and you've got not even a single weapon. You know, unfortunately, I think the church or many people are in the same spiritual position. We're arriving on a battlefield completely unarmed. We've allowed ourselves to be de-armed, or by lack of intention, we are arriving on a battlefield unarmed. I don't think we can have somebody else take our armory away from us. I think it's something that we're allowed to happen, even if due to just being unaware of it. I mean, how much time do we spend reading our word? It's our main, it's our sword. You know, they say a lot of Christians, the only time they get to, to read anything of the Bible is on a Sunday morning if they put it on the screen. <laughs> That's leaving yourself unarmed, <laughs> unfamiliar with the sword. Ephesians 6 tells us about the armor of God and all the different pieces. 
But we walk around never putting any of them on. And if we're not using our sword, it affects the rest of them. If we're not spending time in the Word, it affects the rest of our armory. We've got to be carrying around a shield of faith. Faith comes from hearing the Word. If we're not hearing the Word, how strong is our shield of faith? So we can look at Saul and his army and say, what's up with those guys? Going to battle with no weapons. But spiritually, we do the same thing. We've heard reminders a couple of times in uh, this last couple of days already that we're in a battle. So if we're in a battle, we should be armed. And it's up to us to make sure that we are armed. We can't blame somebody else. Prayer. We heard prayer is a weapon. Nobody can stop you praying. Only you. Worship. Oh, worship. We heard yesterday. Worship. Nobody can stop you worshiping. Just you. Doesn't matter what situation you're in, you can worship. Nobody can stop you. So if we're not using our weapons, unfortunately, we've got nobody else to blame but ourselves. You know, with the technology that we have available today, I think today's Christian should be the most well-armed ever. You pull out your phone, you can have all translations of the Bible you want. Along with any Bible study book, along with any exposition, many, many anointed people's thoughts on those scriptures, you can have it all just in your, in your, in your phone. Any millions of worship songs, you just open up your phone and whatever music app you're using, and you're going. We should be the most well-equipped army that's ever been. Praying together, so much easier. Oh man, I can't get to there, but I can FaceTime you. We had a lady in the church has been in a hospital for she had been about six weeks, just feeling lonely. We were in there with the iPad, streaming her into to a life group meeting so that we can pray with her, that the whole group she can see and be brought up, and encouraged by the rest of the body. And we should be excelling in this because of everything we have available to us. Let's carry on. 1 Samuel 14 verse 2 says, Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With them were about 600 men. So we've already read that they're there for battle. And his men that are with him for battle are parking off underneath the pomegranate trees. Sitting around, eating some pomegranates. Inactive in what they were there to do. They were there with a purpose. Lost sight of their purpose. They're not on the battlefield. They're an army. They're there to do battle. But instead, they're sitting unarmed under the pomegranate trees. I think there's too many of us who have slipped underneath the pomegranate trees and off the battlefield just slightly lost sight of the purpose that God has for us and have drifted underneath the pomegranate trees. We've had a lot of encouragement about getting back to the front foot, getting back to the battle. Remember, we're part of an army. We've got a job to do. I think God's trying to remind us, hey, guys, get out from under the pomegranate trees. 
We've got a job to do. We've got a kingdom to advance. Let's get out from under the pomegranate trees and back onto the, the, the battlefield where we can fulfill our purposes that he has for us. There's a lot of things that push us under the pomegranate trees. Some of them have been mentioned before. But people dealing with past hurts that you've left unresolved can slowly slide you back under the pomegranate trees as you lose your motivation to be a part of something. I've done it before and I got burnt. This is, I think it's a, it's a, a line we've all heard many, many times. I used to do this, but then I got burnt. So now I'm not doing it anymore. We can't let the actions of somebody stop us from the calling and purposes that God, our great King, has given us. Let's deal with them. Let's get them sorted out so that we can get out from under the pomegranate trees. And I know COVID caused many people and churches to lose their rhythm because it physically forced us onto, uh, under the pomegranate trees, if you have them at your house. But while we were there, I think some of us lost sight of the purpose that God has for us. I know some churches closed completely for COVID. You know, one even in our town, like, we don't know what else to do. We're just going to close the doors. I'm like, man, you've lost sight of the reason you exist. <laughs> Now we've heard the, the Bonner report, that, that study that was done in the U.S. And it says that of all the active Christians that were going to church before COVID, since COVID, 32% of them have never returned. Never returned. Sitting under the pomegranate trees. Many, I know, every church leader I've spoken to, oh, we lost people during COVID. I know it was a shaking and we get to see who's there and who's not there, and who's locked into the kingdom and, and, and all of these kind of things. But at the same time, we've lost pieces of the body that we need to come and play their parts to help the body become strong, healthy, mature, and walk into plans and purposes God has for us. Another thing that pushes us under the pomegranate trees is getting wrapped up in the wrong battles. Because that wears you out. It was mentioned already. <laughs> I was trying to remember who it was, but it slipped my mind. <laughs> Tyron, I believe it was Tyron, getting wrapped up in the wrong battles. Man, that, that totally takes our focus away from where it's supposed to be. And when he starts, I can imagine these guys sitting under the pomegranate trees. How long would it take for them to start arguing over something insignificant? Stop spitting your pups over here. <laughs> Throw your pills away. Come on. Wait for the things to get properly ripe. Why are you eating them early? It's going to give you an upset stomach. Then what? You, uh, you can just imagine all these stupid arguments that are going to start. But that's what happens when we get stuck under the pomegranate trees. We get wrapped up in fighting battles that actually are detracting us from the plans and purpose God actually has for us. We throw our energy into that, and then we don't have any for this. 
But this is what God had for us, and we're not, you know. I think sometimes it's also come up already. I think just take the other preachers, take all the nice points, put them together, and just you know, say that was Brendan's talk for the morning. <laughs> it's just not a good view of ourselves. Yeah. Doubting ourselves. I am not this person that God is saying. I can't do these things. I can't do that. We had that picture that Steve brought of in the bo- sitting in the glass box, slightly stooped. And I, I know he was talking about the nation, but I, I really feel there's people that are uh, in the same position. This is it. I'm stuck here. This is as far as I can go. And God just wants you to stand up and break out of there. I believe God really wants to strengthen the sense of purpose in the church again. Focus us back on the right battles. Focus us back on the destiny and the call that he has for every single person, every single church here. I think he wants to help us get back the rhythm that we may have lost. When we walk out of step with the Lord, it it gets very tiring. He wants us to get back in step with him. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Let's get back to His purposes, because those are the ones that are going to prevail. We want to be fruitful. We want to be effective. Let's get back into the plans and purposes that God has for us. That's where we're going to see more of His hand. That's where we're going to see more of His power at work. Every church represented here, you exist for a reason. Steve covered a lot of that last night, pretty well. (laughs) So we're not going to hang here too much. Steve did a great job last night. But every church exists for a reason. What's the plan and purpose God has for you? Are we walking in that plan and purpose? Or are we distracted by other stuff that's pulled us away from that? And we've drifted just back under the pomegranate trees again. Now every person, God's got a plan and purpose for every single one of us. Every single person. You know, often people come and say, ah, the church should do this. You know what? You're part of the church. So you can take ownership of that statement as well. (laughs) I think there's a difference between God's giftings and God's purposes. He gifts us and He gives us giftings, but His purpose, they're linked, but they're different. He has a plan and purpose for us. And when he formed us and put us together, he put us together because he's got good works in store for us. He's got a plan and a purpose and an inheritance for each one of us. And he's gifted us to help us to get there. The tools to help us to walk out the plans and purposes that he has for us. John the Baptist was a prophet. But his job was to prepare the way. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which He prepared in advance for us to do. He's prepared good works for every single one of us. Every single one of us. In advance. Please don't doubt that fact. God has a plan and a specific purpose for every single person here. We want to be effective. We want to be fruitful. One of the things that help that is just getting back in line and in step with God's plans and purposes. 1 Samuel 14, 
verse uh, 1 and verse 6 says, One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistines' outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Verse 6, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. I just love this. I absolutely love this, this guy. He's like, man, buddy, listen, I've got, a, I've got this crazy idea. I'm not even 100% sure it's from God. It's just a thought popped in my head. I'm not sure. I'm not going to tell my old man. Why are you and me? Let's go over to the Philistine outpost and see what happens. Let's just check it. Let's just see what happens. And don't worry that it's just two of us. It doesn't matter if there's two of us. It doesn't matter if this, those 600 pomegranate-eating guys are with us or not. <laughs> because if God's in it, we're going to succeed. It doesn't matter if we're two or 602. That's where the armor bearer says, I'm in. Like a real nutcase. <laughs> But I just love that heart. It's just a, a little prompting, a little thought. You know what? I think, I, think, I think God's got a plan. I think so. Maybe not. I don't know. It says maybe, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. It's just a little stirring that he's feeling from the Lord. And he's ready to respond. God's always speaking to us. And I think sometimes we're always waiting for the clouds to part, this nice golden ray of sun to come down and shine on our face, and somehow not in our eyes at the same time. And this voice that says, this is the Lord. This is what I want you to do. Yeah, with a South African accent. You'll find out when you're in heaven. I'm just preparing you. Sometimes it's like that. Paul had a great encounter with the Lord. Noah gets the plan for the ark step by step by step laid out in front of him. Noah, he has the plan. Shoo. This is what I want you to do. This, 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 this. And Noah gets the whole plan laid out for him. Nice. Sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes it's a little prompting. That we need to respond to. Sometimes it's just that little, hey, what about that person? Oh. But you know what? We often miss those promptings because we didn't know it was the Lord. And if we want to be able to recognize those promptings a lot more, the best way to do that is to spend more time talking with the Lord. And hearing his voice. Now, back in my young years, I was in the military. I say young years. A lady shared a word with me the other day and said, "I had a picture of you, but you were you were young." I thought, "You're like 80, you know." So just... yeah, I was young, yeah. <laughs> And for those who have done military service, you, you, you get used to your, your corporal drilling you and you, your drill instructions, your left, right, all of that kind of thing. You get used to his voice. But for some reason, when they're giving their instructions, they lose the ability to speak normal words. They speak in grunts and sounds. It sounds like you know, like tongues sometimes. It's just, uh, it's, hey, uh, uh, and you're supposed to know what that is. <laughs> but you get used to their voice. Our corporal were used to it. And now we had to do a parade in town. We're going to this big military day. We are all parading through the city. And so for that, they bring out the big wigs. The sergeant major is now coming out. The problem is the sergeant major has never drilled us before. 
And there's three of them standing there, all drilling different companies. And then our sergeant major, we're all standing at ease, and you hear, Hup. well, there's only one thing that can mean, because there's only one place to go, attention. And we're all standing at attention, nice. And then he goes, Hup. I put my money on right turn. <laughs> that guy put his money on left turn. So as I was here, I saw him, I thought, oh dear, I've got to pivot quick, because if he catches me that I turned the wrong way, I'm in for a long afternoon of running up and down the mountain. So I pivoted <laughs> to this guy's dismay. So then I gave up. I thought, I'm in big trouble now. And I looked around, and everyone was doing something different. <laughs> the guy lost his mind. He went red in the face. And those words that came out, we understood very clearly. <laughs> and then we spent the whole day drilling, trying to learn what this guy's saying and him losing his temper again and again and again. Not changing the way he speaks. But you know what happened? By the end of the day, we had it down packed perfectly. And even though there's three of them all shouting different commands at the same time, without looking, we could tell what he's saying. Because we had now spent time with him. We could now hear his voice among the noise and respond instantly to just a little, just a little shout like that. We knew exactly what that one meant with the up and with the down. We knew exactly all his commands just simply by spending time with him and listening to him. So the little promptings we could hear. The same with the Lord. The more we spent talking with him, the more we spend listening to him, the easier it is to hear the little promptings throughout the day. The easier it is in your day-to-day -day life to hear, just pray for this person. Oh, oh man, you look like you're having a rough day. You know? Is it right if I pray for you or something? And you're releasing living waters everywhere you go. Because you're able to hear the little promptings quickly and easily and respond to them. Where we're not like, Jonathan, perhaps the Lord will, perhaps he won't. I know that's the Lord's voice because I hear it so often. And when we, I know we say, oh, we need to spend more time in, in God's presence. And we do. But I think we also need to maybe adjust a little bit our time in God's presence. Now David says in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. All He wants to do out of all the things He could want, He just wants to sit in the Lord's presence gazing at His beauty. I think we need to spend more time sitting in His presence doing nothing else but gazing at His beauty. Because we talk about, I need to spend time in the presence. Oh, you need an answer on this. You need to go spend time in His presence. But then we're going to His presence, we're spending time, but all we're listening for is the answers we want to hear. Especially preachers. Where's my preach? I need the topic. How about we just go hang out in His presence and say, Lord, I'm with you. How magnificent are you? How beautiful are your ways. And just be there. David wrote this. Things weren't going that smoothly at the time. But even though, it's like, he goes there. He says, all I want to do is gaze at your beauty. There's a whole lot of, there's like ten things he finds. But he doesn't even ask for them. He finds strength and peace and mercy, acceptance. He finds all these things in that chapter. But it's not what he went in there looking for. All he wanted to do is look at God's beauty. So sometimes I think we should tweak and say, Lord, you know what? 
You know my needs. I, I've asked for them. All I'm coming to do is hang out with you. I just want to be in your presence and see your beauty. I remember one of those days struggling for a preach. Everyone does. They just don't say it. You, you have those days. And I had four on my back burner for the Sunday. Okay, I'm going to try this one. Nope, no, it's not that one. Try the next one. I feel it. No, it's not this one. Fourth one. Go on. Oh, heck. <laughs> but by then you're frustrated. Your brain is fogged up. You're like, ah. I, I, I just need to put all of this away. I just walked away from all of it. I put it down, put some worship music on, went and hung out outside. While I'm doing that, the Lord downloads a whole new plan to, to, to reach our city. Just downloads it. This was a couple of years ago. We're still using it, we, and, and it's still effective. Download from God, just straight here. This, I was like, oh, Lord, this is awesome. Telling me something completely different from what I wanted to hear. But because I chucked all of that aside, he was able to speak. <laughs> finished all of that, and I was like, oh, Lord, this is awesome. But I've still got nothing to preach about on Sunday. <laughs> Within minutes, shoof, download. But he wanted me to hear what he wanted to say first, before he was going to tell me what I needed to hear. <laughs> Just be in his presence and let him speak to you. You are going to get way more than you expected, and it's way better that way. Hey, 1 Samuel 14, 7, that's when the armor bearer says to him, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead, I'm with your heart and soul. Oh man, who doesn't want a teammate like that? Guys, I've got a crazy idea. Hey, let's do it, man. I'm with you. Let's just go see it. Let's crash and burn together. Whatever. This is going to be awesome. 1 Chronicles eleven ten says, these were the chiefs of David's mighty warriors. Dave read this yesterday. He said, with, they together, with all Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land as the Lord has promised. That strong support of those mighty warriors with all of the nation, strong support is what helped David to extend the reign over the whole nation. You want to see our churches walk into the fullness of their inheritance. He has something that helps, strong support was mentioned yesterday also about it, the community that this is what we're going to be for we with each other heart and soul David did a great job in this yesterday we'll move on <laughs> verse 11 and 12 when they get to the Philistine camp says to the Philistine the Philistines say look the Hebrews are crawling out from the holes they were hiding in the men at the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, Come up to us. We will teach you a lesson. The lesson is not how to make fig jam. The lesson was going to be a beating of some sort. When we are walking in the plans and purposes God has for us, when we respond to those little promptings, it does not mean we're not going to hear the voice of the enemy. I like to call it the roaring lion syndrome. It says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be alert and sober mind your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone he may devour. So he roars, makes a big noise. And if you have never stood in front of a lion roaring, let me tell you, it's quite something. The better when there's a fence between the two of you is the recommended way to do it. Because it's amazing how your whole body tenses up, except your bells. They do the opposite. They go the other route. But it roars, it reverberates through you. We say the enemy can be intimidating. 
The ten spies saw giants. They saw big guys. They were there. The lion can roar. Doesn't mean that God's not in it. When we face opposition or when we hear opposition, it's not an excuse to go sit back under the pomegranate trees. For Jonathan and his armor bearer, the lion roared. They thought, awesome. Fantastic. God's going to show these guys something now. Man, don't quit on something just because we're getting opposition. If you felt God speak, run with it. Stick it out. See it to the end. Complete the task. It can be hard work. It says the two of them, they climbed on their hands and feet, so the terrain wasn't very good to get up there. And when they got up there, and the Philistines called them in, and they went, yes, this is good. They walked into the camp. It said they killed 20 Philistines in the space that's a little bit smaller than a football field. So they had to get in there and fight. They didn't walk in there, and the Philistines just fell over. Just because... It's hard work doesn't mean it's not God's plan. Sometimes God's plans involve hard work. But because it's God's plan, we know we've got God's hand with us. And although they were two and killed 20, God looked after them. He made that possible. Just like he's going to make it possible for you when you stick to his plan and his purpose. Even if it gets tough, even if the enemy roars, even if the work is hard, if it's his plan, he's going to help you see it through. One Thess- uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 4 says, Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all persecutions and trials you are enduring. I wish we can say that for every single church. We boast about your perseverance. Excellent. The last few years were tough, but you guys swung for the fences regardless. Katie's getting nervous, so I'm going to wrap it up. She's watching the clock tick down. <laughs> let's, let's, let's be an army that is well armed, that are familiar and skilled with the sword because we've spent so much time in it. Let us not be hanging out under the pomegranate trees, but out there sticking to the plans and purposes that God has for us. Let's be a people who are regularly found gazing at His beauty, just enjoying being in His presence, allowing Him to say whatever He wants to say to us. Let's be a people who are never shy or scared to respond to the little promptings that he gives us because those little promptings can result in great big victories for ourselves and for others if you're one of those that are under the pomegranate trees because of uh, past hurts or you're feeling that's not me I'm not good enough to be used for that and I, I know we prayed last night for you but my prayer again is See yourself the way God sees you. Jackie spoke about looking in the mirror of the word. Believe what it says. And if you're the one in the closed box, man, stand up with some courage and proud and some confidence because your father's got big plans and purposes for you. Amen. Amen.